Okay, so Mike, I want to thank you uh, very much for coming on the Conscious Revolution show. Um, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. I've been a guest on your podcast a couple of times. Uh, it's always a treat. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks for letting me come and come and do it because you know I've been following your show for ages. You know I love it, love your work. So we appreciate the support for sure. Uh, congratulations on being a new father. That's really amazing. Thanks, man. Cheers. Yeah, it's tiring. Tiring. Yeah, sleep has disappeared. I don't know where it's gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. The first yeah. few weeks, you know, it, it gets better after like maybe eight or nine months, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, or well, eighteen years, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something to that effect. Yeah. Um, so I, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your background. I know you have a, a lot of interest in shamanism and plant medicine. That you uh, prior to that, it sounds like you were heavily into meditation. I don't know if it was a certain type of, of meditation or a certain school of Buddhist thought that you ascribe to. But um, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got interested in these things in the first place? And a little bit about your your background and your practice. Yeah, I mean, I always always had a little bit of an interest in the occult growing up, um, but but it was never serious. Um, I always sort of kept it to myself, and you know, thought I was a bit weird and stuff. Um, but no, it was only till sort of my early mid twenties when I had a you know my own sort of ego death. You know, I was a bit of a uh, an egotistical arsehole when I was a bit younger. Um, and I ended up turning to, um, to Vedanta because I, I, it was, it was all an accident really. I sort of ended up having a fasting for three days, but by mistake, I mean, it, it, I didn't intend to fast. I just was so, uh, in such a bad state that I just didn't eat. And I ended up sort of it turned me inward. So as I sort of turned inward from fasting, I didn't, you know, realize what was happening. And I started actually feeling different vibrations and different sort of just very subtle energies I'd never felt before. And I came across a book called um, Self-Knowledge by C uh, Sri, Sangha <laughs> Sri Shangakara Kriya. That's the one. And uh, yeah, I read that. And um yeah, it changed everything for me. So there was sort of, you know, it's talking about, you know, your practices in terms of pranayama and breath and breath retention. Um, you know, and it turned my world upside down in terms of, you know, talking about everything as an illusion. Um, so, yeah, it, you know, there's all these, you know, things like five five sheaths that, you know, cover up you know the, the the brahman and the atman and the jiva which is you know the, essentially the soul and stuff and it all just blew my mind and but it made sense to me at the time um and yeah it uh, that's that's kind of where it took off and i started meditating and then from there um i met a guy that um i guess he was my guru really um i won't name him because he swore me to never mention his name but um yeah, he, he kind of put me onto the onto the path and started introducing me more. And it was one of those coincidences where he'd already read the, some of these Sanskrit texts that I was discovering and, you know, he passed some over to me. And then um, I've not really stopped since. I've sort of, yeah, never stopped. So. And then at some point psychedelics came into the picture or was that something that was already, have you already had that experience before you moved on to the meditation practice? I'd had some poor sort of recreational experiences in the past. So, you know, I'd done the typical, you know, smoke weed and I tried mush mushrooms when I was younger. Um, and I'd had a pretty traumatic um, experience when I, I mix, mix some weed with MDMA when I was probably about 24 and I had a pretty bad time on it. And I saw some things that I, I didn't know what was going on, didn't know what to make of it. Um, it actually caused me to have a seizure. Um, and I never really went back to it after that. Um, but then, yeah, it was only after, you know, my meditation and things. Um, it was then really that I started to, to look at other things as well. And I was reading more texts sort of like when I went back to university and stuff, I ended up reading the doors of perception by Huxley, um, which made me think about mescaline. And I thought, where, where the hell did you get this? Um, 
and then that turned me towards, you know, cactus and San Pedro and peyote. Um, and I sort of integrated them into my practices and meditation and they took them a bit further. Um, yeah. And then more recently I've, I've sort of brought mush- mushrooms into the equation. Um, ayahuasca, you had your first ayahuasca experience. Recently. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, have, I'd, I'd, ha- I'd attempted to do it 10 years ago and, uh, I think I, I, I even went to brew it and it just being a young egotistical idiot, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't get any advice. I hadn't, I didn't even know that it come from, some, you know, some shamanic tribal tradition. I had no idea. I just thought it was, you know, someone said, Oh, go and get some of this. And I thought, okay, yep. Yeah, blindly going in and nothing happened and nothing worked. So, um, yeah, but it's, probably. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it probably a very good. Yeah. <laughs> It didn't happen. So, but yeah, and then, yeah, recently that was the first time I tried to take a mild dose, not expecting much to happen, and it, it was actually a really interesting experience. As I think I mentioned to you before, I uh, was trying to meditate with it as I normally do. I sort of felt the experience coming on after an hour, um, and then it seemed to just sort of disappear, and I thought, okay, it's, this is it. I've, it was very mild and it's, nothing's really happened. I just had that really deep meditation. And anyway, I, I sort of got up to go and just leave. It probably about an hour and a half had gone. And then I guess it actually started because suddenly, you know, the, it can't start hitting me in waves. And um, I started seeing, you know, some, some, some very real imagery and interacting with, with um, a very strong feminine energy. Um, so yeah, that, that's been my, my use for, with psychedelics now. So yeah. nice. I wanted to go back to something you mentioned earlier, because I, I've kind of been thinking about it a lot lately. The, the, the idea of the invisible college, you said you, uh, studied the occult, so you might be familiar with this, but, um, <clears throat> I, I don't really know why this never triggered these memories for me in the past. But when I was maybe 15 or 16, I started to get this feeling that there was some sort of organization that was, um, I, I couldn't really tell if I was sensing that this was like something of, of earthly office or if it was some sort of just uh, um, manifestation of consciousness or something. But it was basically exactly what the Invisible College is supposed to be. And um I, I, I may have been a little older because I think like right when I really started to kind of pierce the veil, I was really thinking about this a lot. And I, it almost feels like, you know, maybe I was knocking on the door just by thinking about it, which is actually uh, later when I read a description of the invisible college, that is what basically it, it, how it's described um, the people that have this like desire for genuine wisdom, but also the capacity to process truth on a level that makes them sort of worthy for lack of a better word of the experience, the door suddenly swings open. And um, what reminded me of this in this conversation is that you said that you unintentionally started fasting. Um, And right before I really started to have my awakening process, I also, I like, I didn't even realize that I had started to fast until like the second day it kind of occurred to me. And then I knew a few things. I knew that it was going to be four days and four nights that I wasn't going to sleep the entire time. And um, another interesting element of this is that we were in uh, an area that had been very strongly or very uh, uh, densely populated with like Navajo Anasazi back in the day. And, um, you know, we had some Navajo friends and stuff around and like my girlfriend, for example, one day dug some fire pits in the backyard and my Navajo friend went out and said, who did that? And I told her, you know, my girlfriend, she's like, is she native? I said, no. And she said, well, that's exactly the way we dig our ceremonial pits. And there were some other things that were happening that were very much, seemed like we almost like downloaded it from the Native American collective memory or something there. And later I would find out that the four days and four nights of no eating and drinking and no sleeping was actually a practice of the local natives. And another weird layer of this is that the universe seemed to conspire to force me to stick to it. 
um, we went to a meeting, the Star Knowledge Conference, and when I got there, all of the, um, and I should have been suspicious because all of the, the vending machines had signs that said out of order. <laughs> and all the soda machines. And later I found out that Grandma Chandra, who is a girl that cannot speak or walk, uh, she has MS, but she will grab hold of her mother or this other guy. That, I don't know what his relationship to her is. He has like long blonde hair and she, they'll talk for her. And uh, at first I was really suspicious of this, but I think it, it, it may be a real thing. It really looks like it is. Like if you watch her expressions and the words that are coming out of their mouth. Yeah. Just, it's really strange, but I found out that Grandma Chandra had given the order to put these out of order machines. It wasn't wasn't true. And <laughs> after I'd been there for a day or something, I was like, "Man, I'm just gonna eat like just a bag of potato <laughs> chips or something." And the whole, you know, so it was just it was just interesting. It reminded me that it does often seem to me that there's some sort of higher mind that will sort of impose uh, these conditions that catalyze our development. And I just wanted to offer that because it sounded like uh, maybe that's what happened to you. Yeah. I mean, I had, I had lots of, I've had lots of strange events in my life as well, which I think I've only sort of thought about afterwards and realized that they probably link in there somewhere. So one of them was when I was 17 I was on a bus with my friend Mike, who was on the you know the UFO podcast we did. Um, we were we were at school together, and we were on this bus and public bus, and we both sat on the top deck, sat at the back of it, and anyway, there was this, this old lady sat sort of in the middle, reading a book. Um, she was sort of mumbling to herself, and being sort of two young, spotty seventeen-year-olds, we just thought, you know you're a bit you act a bit arrogant and you know a bit you know you're sort of just ignorant to them but she approached us and she she just sort of said she said she'd been talking to her swami and we so we we're sort of looking at each other already like what's going on here i didn't know what swami was you know mike didn't know what a swami was um and she's had she had a hand on this book and she was like i've been talking to him um, and then she said to she said to Mike, "You need to go and call your mum. She's not very well. You need to give him a give her a phone call." So he's sort of just laughing, really, just what are you talking about? I know my mum's okay. I saw her yesterday. Um, and then she said to me, she went, "Oh, you know," she said, uh, "You know, you're you need to make sure that you stay on a good path. You know, you can you you can end up on a you know a dark path if you don't you know do the right thing in life." And she said. You know, like your, you know, like your sister. So she, she already knew. She knew I had a sister, and she said, she said that she was a. She said, I know your sister's a radiologist, which is very specific. And I thought, how how do you know that? I haven't mentioned it. And my sister, she's not a radiologist, so that, that's sort of the doctor of, you know, X rays and things. She's actually a radiographer, which is, but for me, that's that's close enough. I never forget it. And I'm, now I was sort of think, thinking, has this woman been following me? This is a bit weird. Um, and then the last thing she said to Mike was, you know, because at the time he was quite, um, he, he had quite a lot of acne. He said, she said, you need to eat a bowl of cabbage a day and that'll go. Just eat cabbage for a week and you'll get rid of that. And then when we got off the bus and he obviously he rang his mum and his mum, it turned out his mum was unwell and she'd, she'd been taken to the hospital. Um, and I ne we never forgot it, but afterwards I think we rationalised it as some sort of, oh, you know, maybe... Yeah, you know she's some trickster or something I don't know and it was one of those things that I, it's, it's come back to me since all this started I just thought I, I really wish I knew what book she was holding and what Swami she was talking what on earth she was talking about but that was one of those strange incidences that I've thought you know there are certain people at certain points who've come up to me because it's, it's, it's happened to me several times now where people like that have come up to me and and said very similar things um three or four it's happened, well, it's happened three times now. Um, and that, that one was before I sort of started meditating and things like that. Um, but yeah, so. It's, it's I guess, really interesting that you bring that up because the first time I ever experienced that, as far as I can recall, was Grandma Chandra. Uh, before I left to go to that, um, the Star Knowledge Conference, uh, 
I don't even know why, but there was a book by Timothy Leary on my counter and I didn't put it there. So I picked it up to see what it was as I was walking yeah. out of the house. And it's, it, it was a book called Your God Act Like One. And when I met Grandma Chandra, like you mentioned, the Swami, uh, the way people talk about how when they're in the presence of the guru, they just fall to their knees and have this overwhelming feel of, feeling of love. Well, I was talking to this like Zen master guy, and he said, there's somebody that wants to talk to you over there. And so I said, okay. And I, 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 we ended the conversation, and I walked over towards uh, where he had pointed, and I found myself on my knees, overwhelmed with this feeling of of, of um, what I recognize now to be um, unconditional love. And I looked around and there were other people dropping to their knees and there was a big group and there was this girl who obviously had MS or something. And I was just blown away. I, like, I was like, this, did this just really happen? And she grabs her mother's arm and her mother looks at me and says, you're a God, act like one. And I was like, <laughs> yeah what in the hell was that you know and um i've experienced it a few times like you were saying and i guess what i was curious is these people that approached you i mean it sounds like this lady was on the order of maybe a bag lady or something that she seemed disheveled or maybe mentally ill at all or... yeah absolutely yeah she didn't seem the other people as well or uh, the other guy was an old guy in a pub and he, he took my hands and he, he was desperate to read my hands. And again, I was with Mike this time. And this is like 12 years after that event. And I was in a pub with him and I was, it was with his new family. So his brother-in-law and someone else. And obviously, because I, I remember Mike saying to them, this is the kind of weird shit that happens when Mike's around like me, because I'd never met his family before. It's like this weird stuff happens when Mike's around. And he just, this guy just started looking at my hands and he goes, oh, you need to, he said, there's, there's many things hidden in there. I'm, I'm not going to talk to you. And he sort of just like almost, and he wouldn't tell me what he was talking about, but he, he, he was desperate to look at my hands and then he just sort of went away. And I, again, to this day, I have no idea what, he, he didn't give me any, you know, like prediction, like the other lady, or this is what's going on. But he made a point of coming to me, picking me out, looking at my hands and going, Ugh. and he, he seemed like disgusted, to be honest. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, yeah. And the, I think the, the other one again was another lady um, who, again, I, again, it was in a pub environment that came up to me and uh, she said, oh, you know, don't worry about it you know i think I, I was having a really crap time and i was still sort of off you know coming off the back of the end of my sort of tra trauma and stuff like that and she was you know i'd grown my hair and you know before pre my own ego death i had you know shaved face shaved head i was you know looked like a a right jock you know that kind of thing but she she um she sort of just came up to me and again was like oh you don't need to hide under that anymore you know you just be proud of it and I didn't even, I didn't know her and I, I've, I've never seen her since. Um, but yeah, that was another one of the strange ones that happened. Um, so, yeah. Well, there's a reason I ask. And I think that um, uh, there, there's, there's a couple of layers to this, I guess. Um, Alistair Crowley once said, uh, the mystery always casts itself in a way, or the mystery always presents itself in a way that casts doubt upon itself. And so um, an example of that would be how, you know, psychedelics uh, for a lot of people to hear, you know, you take these compounds and then you're, you actually encounter uh, interdimensional beings uh, in the case of DMT or a uh, plant spirit in the case of ayahuasca or whatever. And, or uh, telepathy is reported very, very regularly with a number of compounds. And so that's the kind of thing that people are going to laugh off like, oh, well, you're just high. Yeah. But this is how the mystery always has presented itself, apparently, you know, in these ways that um, that challenge the uh, credulity of people, I guess. And so yeah. um, one of the theories I think that I, 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 I believe this is probably the case and partly because my like I used to actually go and seek out schizophrenics and talk to them just because um, – I just, I felt like they weren't really quite exactly just insane, that there was more to it than that. Yeah. And uh, there are anthropological researchers 
that have labeled um, shaman essential schizophrenics. It's a different type of schizophrenia with different characteristics than paranoid schizophrenia or, um, I mean, it could almost be thought of as like a uh, functional alcoholic compared to a non-functional alcoholic or something. <laughs> yeah. And the idea is that they, the filters that we just like the way when a normal person takes a psychedelic and they bring down these filters, uh, we can receive information from the minds of others or, uh, or the incoming signals from other forms of DNA plants. And, you know, some people believe that's how ayahuasca was discovered and how they were instructed to prepare it was directly from the incoming DNA signals. And, um, and that was one of the things that, you know, I've had a number of these experiences as well. Uh, people on the street that have, I've never met before in my life that have identified me repeatedly as um, some historical figure. Uh, and also, uh, I mean, I think I may have been talking to you about this. So when I, the, the, uh, I went to Big Sur to the Hearst Castle and I was thinking, man, it would be amazing to play a gig here. And then we went to Santa Cruz downtown and the street people were like walking up to me and saying things like, Hey, remember that gig at the Hearst castle you were thinking about doing earlier? Uh, my brother could probably arrange that and this kind of stuff. And so clearly there's something to that. I mean, I, and, yeah. and what really got me about that is that it is so specific that the chances of um, coincidence are practically nothing. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's that. And, and in your case, it sounds like it's the same thing. So that's why I was checking in with you about the state of these people, because in my experience, they've been street people or there has been some sort of obvious issue Yeah. with people that seem to be able to receive these si signals. And I think that actually does support the idea that there are uh, neuro filters of some kind that are, down and so that gives these people the capacity to do that i've often wondered what they think sometimes because i've had people come up and just say stuff that they shouldn't know but it also shouldn't mean anything to them yeah like what do they think they're saying or what, what why do they think they're doing it or do they even process it or you know what is what is going on with that so i wonder if, i wonder if it's you know like you say this silent college if there are just a group of beings or people that are here just part you know doing their thing and they're they are just they're fully aware of you know all these things uh, they know that we aren't aware of them and they're quite happy to just go, to ease through and and uh, you know try and guide us i don't know but uh, I'm, I'm guessing the only the, the only way that i've ever sort of channeled in partly is when i've i've just completely dissolved any ego so like the first time when I had the trauma and, the, you know, I actually could sort of see these things for myself was when I had trauma had caused my ego and my sense of self to be destroyed, you know, and sort of I could see through it. So that, that was the only time I felt I could tap into it. And then men, when I meditate and I try and dissolve my sense of I-ness and my, that ego mask, that's when I become more sensitive to those things that's how I, I view it um and obviously the psychedelics can help move it take it even get you there even quicker i think sometimes med meditation methods for me take me days um but what i like about the the meditation thing is there's um and i'm doing sort of my nadi um shudhana breathing so one nostril the other nostril breath retention um i i get that tiny vibration at the you know in the top of my my you know the center of my my head and sometimes it can take be days before i have just just really subtle very very subtle intuitions nothing major you know just a silly thing like i can be taking you know writing something like writing down an order when i was sort of work at a restaurant i can i can I can know what the person's about to order before they well before they say you know what I mean and that's normally if I've been taking on a full meditation um, and doing those practices you know strongly um, so yeah 
Well, and that makes sense. I mean, I think there's a couple of levels again to it, just like I guess everything. And, and, and part of it is that, you know, I think we are the, the, the idea of consciousness as a unified field. Um, the ego in the sense of um, uh, an illusory sense of separateness would be a frequency barrier, I would yeah. think, receiving the collective or input from the collective or having a conscious awareness of your um, your being a constituent in a, a single greater mind. Um, and also uh, <clears throat> fear is really the root of, of, of negative ego. I think there's both positive and negative ego. It depends on yeah. how you're speaking about it. But yeah. negative ego is a manifestation of fear, which I think of as like an um, uh, interference pattern. And I've always said that when you're trying to become like a hollow tube to bring down fire from heaven, um, you, you must be hollow. And having this interference pattern is not going to facilitate that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, I totally agree. But speaking of weirdly anticipating stuff, I just noticed um, this branch sitting on the table. I don't know if we can <laughs> see. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so I had no idea what this was. You see that massive thorn right there? And oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's like a few of them. So yeah. I've always called this the Jesus tree. And I've never seen it in bloom before. So I don't know if you can see... See that yeah, little, what does that look like? It's like a little pine cone, isn't it, really? Like a mini oh, one. The sun, it's just like the sun. It's a little oh, round, nice. little yeah, round, yeah, yeah. round yellow ball, just like the sun. Yeah, yeah. And so I just thought that, you know, Jesus being a solar myth and this thing that I've been calling the Jesus tree, I walked by it the other day and it's yeah. covered in little suns. Yeah. And then on top of that, when I got home, I was like, well, I wonder what it is. It looks like an acacia. So I look it up, and apparently it contains 5-MeO-DMT, NN-DMT, and phenylethylamines. Wow. So that was just really trippy. Yeah. So um, I was thinking about aliens, too, and also uh, this idea of, of, of like, panspermia. Um, it's just incredible that, that that's the, the term for this, and... You know, I mean, you say you followed my channel, and this is something I talk about a lot, this, this, this teaching that everything is really one thing doing one thing, and that if you can understand one system, you can understand yeah. all systems and all this kind of stuff. And so I happened to be browsing through a feed, and I saw that now the evolutionary biologists are saying that um, life on Earth was precipitated by the impact of a comet, which is exactly like what? Sperm going into an egg. I mean, it looks like the same yeah. Visually, from really far away, it's macrocosm, microcosm, perfect. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to mention that because what the hell, you know? And then I wanted to ask you where your interest in uh, aliens came from and maybe talk about some of your ideas about that. I know you entertain a possibility that it's some sort of manifestation of consciousness. Um, I, I, I know you recently had an astronaut on your... <laughs> Yeah. Podcast. Uh, I can't remember who Terry was. Terry? Oh, Terry Verts. Yeah, yeah. We've got it. Is. Uh -huh. I got him to answer a question for us. So. Yeah, yeah. So, so what's up with that? I mean, what is your experience, and what do you think it's about? Well, I've always loved, like, even growing up, I've loved, you know, been into the UFO and alien thing, um, and I've always. I've always seen things in the sky, you know, even with my sister and I've always thought them to be a bit strange and, um, but I think it's more recently that I, I kind of feel like I, I, I wouldn't say I've ever had an ET experience as such, like in, um, psychedelic spirit, you know, my psychedelic experiences, I've always, I've met th entities, but I've always kind of th thought of them um, as archetypes. Of, of the self or you know like higher consciousness so they're just a part a part of us that we haven't evolved to yet and it's sort of reaching out and it's pretty scary because we haven't you know we haven't sort of met with it yet but i mean i'm open to all sorts of ideas with it i don't know you know whether it is something external but also i i, I like the idea the other idea i like 
which I think I sent you something the other day is that if everything is one biological system, including, you know, the outer space and here, and it's kind of ties in with what you're saying about the, the sperm idea is um, the idea of these things actually not being UFOs, but actually being, you know, biological, you know, cells or entities. They're not, you know, we're actually perceiving them incorrectly. We think these are flying discs, but they're actually um, biological living things that are just moving through different different uh you know densities and stuff like that that we can't perceive you know we're not evolved enough to see we're just trying to measure it and understand it through our limited five you know senses of perception um so i like that idea and i mean that also ties in with higher consciousness as well for me it's like a you know you think about our the, the, the tiny little cells that make up our bodies. I can't see them and I can't actually make contact with them, but you could argue that they're doing a much more intelligent job than I am, you know, because they're the building blocks of me and I, I'm not aware of them. I don't know if they're conscious not or not or anything like that. So, yeah, I don't know. It's just an interesting one. So when you say you've encountered entities, is there a particular message that you feel like they are transmitting as a varied from entity to entity? Um, I've always, I've, I think maybe because I'm, I feel like I'm at a very early stage of interpreting these things in my own sort of journey into meeting, you know, I've got one particular guy that I'm, I've come across on San Pedro, which I know a lot of people say is quite rare because some people don't often meet entities on from who I've spoke to on San Pedro, but there's one the sort of reptilian like character that sort of always comes out of patterns on the duvets and things that I've got around that I'm looking at and, and carpets. And he's, he's got a very menacing face and a very, uh, like a, almost like a trickster arch archetype, but he's always sort of doing that tip of the hat kind of wink at me to say, you know, I'm actually part of you, you know, all the, all the strange things, you know, but it, it's, that's one of them. That's the kind of the reptilian, the reptilian idea that's, that's come from San Pedro. And then obviously the other one that I had was the ayahuasca, you know, experience where, um, it was a very strong feminine entity and it did manifest in all sorts of, you know, different sh shapes. And at one point it was very clearly an, an you know, an elderly native, native Indian American, you know, a native American Indian lady. And she looked pretty angry and pretty uh, upset with me. And at one point she, she sort of morphed into this two legged ball. So it was just like a ball with two legs and it was still just doing all these, it was almost trying to like hypnotize. I felt hypnotized. It was sort of trying to, you know, I could feel lots of different energies in my body while this was happening. So I could feel, you know, whether you'd say, you know, you, you ascribe to the idea of chakras and stuff while all this was happening, I could feel them, her manipulating those areas, all those areas, which I, I found strange. I'd never felt that on, I'd never felt that before. Um, but I'd never got the sense, I never got the sense once that it was some sort of alien or, you know, transdimensional being. Um, I got the sense that it was more spiritual and more, you know, something that's part of a bigger, you know, a bigger, you know, higher vibration of energy. Um, so, yeah. I mean, it's, it's an interesting one because obviously I think I mentioned to you before about there was that study into... Um, alien abductions where they said that a lot of people that had experienced alien abductions um were, were westerners and a lot of people who talk about aliens appearing in ayahuasca retreats and stuff are often westerners whereas you know the people the natives they don't ever ascribe to them being aliens they you know talk of star tribes or um you know they're spiritual beings that are you know spiritual ancestors and stuff like that so it's an, it's an interesting one. It's whether it's that Western brain that just can't get its head around it and wants to just make it aliens. Well, it's funny, though. <laughs> Recently, um, I, uh, I was talking to a local shaman that actually had laughed at me for... Um, I mean, it was actually... It, it was really surprising because he, he was almost hostile and definitely condescending during the medicine circle. 
after an ayahuasca ceremony when I, I brought this up is it's like he really bothered him, triggered him somehow. And then a couple of weeks ago, I saw him and he said, uh, I've seen UFOs around my house lately. <laughs> that really, that really got me because I think it, for one thing, when people are predisposed to belief that is going to increase the possibility of some sort of uh, um, faulty perception. And, uh, but the opposite is true if someone is um, antagonistic to the idea. Um, so it just, it, it, it really seemed interesting to me that, that this, this shaman suddenly was sheepishly admitting that he had seen something that he couldn't come to terms with in, in any other kind of way. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that is an interesting point, and, but there, there is some variation there because it depends on what is meant by Westerner, I think. There are definitely some indications in Italy, Syria, um, ancient Babylonia. There's some pretty convincing rock carvings that look like what the hell else would they be besides rocket ships. Also, um, one of the most convincing uh, uh, examples of this sort of ancient alien evidence that I'm aware of, the tribe of Judea, uh, when they encounter the uh, Ark of the Covenant, they describe it as a metal tent that flies around. And if you make the, the uh, being in sight, only, well, only Moses is allowed to see its face. And it, um, <clears throat> it turns on flames on the back of the tent and incinerates people that piss it off. Uh, sounds like it just turns the engine on. Um, <laughs> it knew all this stuff about disease, you know, don't lay with a person with sores, and what the hell is that about? It seemed to know yeah. that pigs carried potentially deadly parasites back then and told them not to eat pork. I mean, it's yeah. just very strange that this also later, it's floating a foot off the ground, and it will blow up. Uh, we would call them battalions, I guess, just tribes, other tribes. Uh, it seemed to have an interest in uh, political manipulation. It, it really kind of seems like this sort of, um, I don't know if it was Stone Age or Bronze Age when all this was supposed to happen, but, you know, tribal people a long time ago, um, they would have totally just uh, believed that this alien that they had encountered was God. I mean, that would be the assumption. It's some sort of higher being that is capable of magic and um so there's that you know i think ezekiel is a pretty goddamn weird uh tribal account so that very well could be an alien encounter and then of course we have the, the native american tribes in north america some of whom have these star tribe legends um and i believe don't quote me on this but the aboriginal peoples in uh australia i think have some um like fables, I guess, uh, um, myths that could be interpreted as contact with some, and also drawings, I think, that are, you know, potentially. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it does seem like there's not a lot of South American shaman that interpret these things in that way. But I think over time in different areas, there's been some stuff that could potentially you know, it's not as direct as the star tribes in North America, but it could be something. I'm curious as well when you say this, uh, this, um, this, this, this uh, cactus uh, creature is reptilian. Do you mean that it actually looks like a lizard? That it um, has scales, or just that it's green? It had, it, it had, it had scales, um, which made me wonder. See, it's in mind to obviously, you know, you try, try and rationalize these things after it made me wonder whether the, the mescaline had moved. Obviously, you've got different I think, parts of the brain that you don't necessarily always enter or, you know, or use. And I just wonder if it, it, put, it put me in the reptilian part of the brain. So I don't know if there were sort of, you know, whether the gamma rate, like they say with mushrooms, you have more access to the gamma that are actually in your brain and stuff like that. And I. I, I don't know, but it was definitely, it had scales. It reminded me of the clown thing from it, but it had scales. <laughs> yeah. Um, it had a very uh, pointed, had a pointed sort of uh, face and a very sort of 
pointed smile, sort of triangular smile, triangular. It was, but it, it, it emerged in all the patterns. So it was, if I was looking at a pattern on the sofa or I was looking at a pattern on the, um, specifically it was one of these rugs, it was coming out. And then the, the strange thing is when I sort of, I don't know if you ever try and defocalize your vision, um, like you do with those gestalt illusions you get, you, you cross your eyes type thing. If I, I found that if I could, if I do that when I'm not, you know, using cactus, sometimes the image, I can sometimes see the image that I saw while I was not in the same detail, but I can start to see the where the pattern had formed and see, I can see the face of the thing in the, in the duvet or in the, on the, on the, um, but yeah, just, it definitely had a menacing ele element to it, but it also, I picked up, there were lots of insights that I remember, I, mean, I made a lot, quite a bit of notes and there were lots of detailed insights about the nature of how things worked and reality and um, that came in when I was experiencing that. So I just didn't know whether it was actually as menacing as, it, as I, th I thought it was maybe trying to educate me and that I, I didn't fully, because of the fear that I maybe I was projecting it as something that was a bit negative because I was a bit, you know, fearful of it. You know, I'm perceiving this for the first time. Maybe that was it that my brain manifested it as something negative looking. Um, whereas I think I was more prepared with, with ayahuasca. I had no fear whatsoever when I, when that, um, that whatever that entity, feminine entity had appeared because I, already made sort of I'd meditated my way into that experience of being like I'm just going to give up fear I'd almost made the decision I was like if I'm going to die I'm going to die and I'm happy to go and let go and I'd done all that process before doing it and it it, it helped me quite a bit it made me just be like yeah I'm, I'm free now to just experience and see what it is and it it wasn't a fearful experience which I actually genuinely thought it was going to be a very fearful experience but it wasn't as bad as I thought so. not this time no, not this time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I anticipate that kind of thing, and then it's not. But then the next time it uh, goes ahead and rears its its horns or whatever. Um, I'm probably setting myself up for that, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. And and, and uh, it's 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 an interesting in time in a lot of ways. I've noticed, you know, I've never really been uh, too much of a, a believer in astrology. Not that. I don't think that it's um, real in the sense that it, it, it's, it's, it's not that we're not uh, potentially being informed by the position of, because it's just really representing an energetic expression right behind it all. It's just energy. And if you can use the stars to navigate the ocean, then I'm sure you can. Uh, it's, it's, it's going to have the same function on other layers, you know? And so, the other day I noticed everything was going super crazy, chaotic. And um, I thought, well, Mercury's got to be in, 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 in retrograde. And I came and, and checked, and it turns out that Mercury is in retrograde until uh, the middle of Election Day in the United States, hmm. which seemed absurd. And then this Halloween, uh, I decided to do a, a, a live stream on um, the, the, the Gnostic Lucifer uh, the metaphysics of it and whatnot. And in the occult, um, the light of Lucifer is said to be blue. And so it's on Halloween, it's, uh, it's full moon, a full moon <laughs> and it's yeah. a blue moon. Yeah. For a blue moon and a full moon to land on Halloween is yeah, pretty, freaky. Yeah, yeah. And so I just, I, you know, I wonder if, um, this it, and and the way that this ties into what you were talking about actually is that um I, I feel like if there is like truth to astrology and whatnot the way that these things are becoming so blatantly um they're expressing so concisely you know so much more obviously than we've experienced in the past and it, you know there there it's, it seems like it's happening in a lot of areas and we have um people having these uh, extraordinary experiences. I, I, I've kind of, I've considered that uh, the way you were talking about the patterns and the being sort of using the patterns and the shadows to uh, sort of give themselves form. 
It was, it was really interesting listening to you talk about that, actually, because uh, one of the last times that I drank ayahuasca by myself, I actually saw uh, these beings doing that. And um, the, in this particular instance, uh, there was like the web of patterns that you see when you're, um, you know, in pretty much any entheogenic state. Um, I was trying to uh, receive a drum um this happened how do i get rid of this there we go okay sorry um i was trying to receive a song shamanic songs and uh suddenly this uh presence sort of wrapped the uh tendrils of color around itself and it kind of made it a form out of it so that it had like almost like a sombrero and it had like a cloak and it leaned its head like right onto my forehead and it's like wow. hey, what else what else <laughs> you know and i was like hi you know and I, <laughs> it kind of like encouraged me to play the music and drum and stuff and i feel like the way that these things like halloween and the full blue moon and the the Mercury and retrograde ending when the U S has its election and all this kind of stuff is not somehow the same thing as this consciousness using these, uh, energies in order to give presence to itself, to give form to its being so that we have a way of, of interacting and being aware of its presence. Um, these are what a number of years ago I predicted that if we really are moving into a collective higher consciousness space, that the kind of synchronicities that people experience on an individual basis would start to happen on a collective basis. And it seems to me that the same way that these manifestations of consciousness use these uh, energetic um, constructs in, in order to give articulation to their being, um, if the universe isn't doing that on a, grand scale and that these kind of things are, are evidence of that you know yeah yeah it's interesting you say about the um sort of astrological side i don't know if you've heard of this one that, that there's one that's some people have been i say some people it's been taught it's been sort of woven into hollywood films for like the last 30 years and it's to also do with this conjunct junction of jupiter pluto um and saturn um and i think it goes back as far as in back to the future it's in back to the future you've got the clock tower which is sort of representative of saturn and then you've got um plutonium which is used to obviously blow it up so the guy can travel back in time and then you've got there's a little scene where hades or you know which is representative representative of um oh the other planet the um Pluto, Pluto, yeah, Pluto, Jupiter, yeah, Jupiter representative of Zeus, who's always seen with that's it with lightning. So the lightning hits the li lightning hits the tower, um, which is sort of the, also associated with wisdom, isn't it? Um, but it's, the long story short is though the combination of those three three things are uh, the idea that uh, you know Jupiter and Pluto and got together to defeat saturn who represents time so time's basically been defeated so he can reverse time and go back in time um and this is supposed to be the thing that's happening this year um and loads of astrologers have sort of been going on about it and saying well there was one conjunction in march these three planets lined up for the first time in march they then lined up again in june and then they're finally going to line line up again again at the end of the year um, and lots of occultists are lining up their rituals to match, to meet, you know, the, their, you know, their practices to meet up with the, with the oh, conjunction. Well, there's another one, actually, there's a lot of people that are from different traditions that are saying it, whatever you're it's particularly beginners, that if you're trying to do some kind of working that that's, you know, very auspicious, auspicious time for it. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I've also considered that we are just about totally fucked. Um, <laughs> yeah. the, oceans, the oceans are nearly dead. North Korea, I mean, seeing Kim Jong-un crying the other day during his apology, I mean, that was a 
fucking mind blower. That's not even supposed to be possible. Dictators. I didn't. Uh, I didn't what, see that. What, what was what happened? I didn't. That's not. He was he he was upset because he mismanaged COVID, and he was actually he was apologizing to the people. And he was crying. Wow. And you know you don't see Donald Trump crying about anything. You know I mean or, yeah. you know, see like they were supposed to do stimulus months ago. It was supposed to be the richest empire in the history of the world, and they're just obviously making up excuses. Yeah. Oh, uh, there's no. I mean, I remember when. And it's crazy how, I mean, I have learned so much about psychology. I'm also scaring myself because I've realized I've predicted the system so accurately so many times. It means that I understand it, which doesn't bode well at all if I'm correct yeah. about the rest of it. You know what I mean? So, um, uh, um, there's just a lot of really fucking wonky shit going on. And uh, I mean, when I was, I guess, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what I mean about the psychology of things. Um, people's ability to uh, totally um, uh, select a perception, you know, to just choose what they're going to perceive and what, what not. There's this big thing in the States about how Trump is so racist and he's a Nazi. And that's why all of the people on the other side of the aisle are saying, don't vote for him. Well, if you actually go on YouTube and you look for all of the stuff that they're saying, like they said that he refused to um, disavow uh, white supremacists at the, at the um, debate, he actually said, sure, sure. There's a whole bunch of interviews where he says, I have no, I hate, hate crimes and, you know, KKK, fuck all those people. And over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. And um, Joe Biden is constantly, I mean, even recently, you know, he compared uh, black children to cockroaches and uh, poor kids are just as smart as white kids. And so, <clears throat> What, what I'm getting at here is that you very clearly see that as far as the actual evidence, people are perceiving quite literally the exact opposite of what is actually there yeah. in, 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 in terms of provable, you know, video evidence. And um, so I, I, I guess, you know, to steer us back on course here uh, with um, – yeah, King Jong Un. Yeah, it's cool that he was crying, but they have been uh, giant nukes uh, being paraded up and down the streets. I mean, there's a reason they're doing that. They they're not doing these displays of power just because it's fun or something. You know, they're definitely yeah. there's definitely some uh, degree of threat. Uh, the tension between Russia and China and the United States. Speaking of prophecy, I mean that's a that's an old one. I don't know where it came from, but something about yeah. the bear, the dragon, and the eagle. You know, and now that's a thing. Obviously, there's a tremendous amount of tension there. Um, ecologically, you know, we're, we're really like running out of fish and stuff in the ocean. Uh, Tens yeah. of the life that was there in 1970 still exists. Uh, China is out of food. They're here in Ecuador and Peru fishing illegally in the Galapagos Islands because they have no choice, apparently. Um, uh -huh. That's pretty terrifying because the country that I live in is pretty much entirely dependent upon the um, there's the Humboldt current that comes through here and it's full of nutrients. And so there's all these fish and it's one of the last places where it's like really, really consistent, solid commercial catches. And so now China has come and um, when, you know, the, the, the Ecuadorian government, Peruvian government say, what the fuck are you doing out there? They're like nothing. Mind your own business. You know, and really, mm -hmm. what are these countries going to do to China? And then, you know, on top of all of that, we have the U.S. saying it's coming into the same waters to do military drills right where <laughs> China is illegally fishing right now. Yeah. In, in November. Wow. So, um, uh, what I'm kind of getting at here is that if the shit is going to hit the fan, it's now-ish. Right yeah. Now. now. There's, a, there's a feeling, isn't there, that end of November, end of November December, there's going to be some sort of global event that's going to really kick, kick shit up and you know I, that's the sense that everyone i mean i don't know if i i don't know where i that's what people are saying but i don't know where i stand on it it feels like it feels like it yeah things are there's no turning back from the way things are at the moment there's no solution so why would they Oh, there are solutions, but there yeah. are people who have a vested interest in occulting those solutions and dissuading people from receiving them. For example, psychedelics. Uh, the common yeah. Yeah, yeah. that people were 
deluded that the that the government was freaked out and that's why they banned them has no reality to it. The researchers in the 60s said this is amazing. We can cure addiction and depression and PTSD and all of this shit in a single treatment. And that is why Big Pharma said send cops down there and stop these motherfuckers before they yeah. destroy it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And if there is truth, which I, I, I mean, I know that there is experimental data to corroborate this idea that, uh, you know, these illnesses all have some kind of emotional and, 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 and psychological basis, at least uh, in the beginning, um, that their, 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 their roots are energetic, which would, of course, have to be true unless physics is completely wrong about everything. Yeah. Um, so... I guess what I'm saying about this is that, uh, uh, speaking of China, um, the Chinese character for uh, crisis is two other Chinese characters combined, danger and opportunity. And I think that that speaks to the dualistic uh, nature of everything. And I don't know that a positive outcome is necessarily guaranteed, but I do think that, you know, um, one of the things that we probably have in common is that we're sort of at least at least inclined to suspect that there is some sort of um, awakening and the potential for a sort of new world to emerge from all of this chaos. And it's just a crazy thing to consider that all of this chaos and all of this danger and all of this stuff is totally necessary in order to um, create the circumstances that would potentially give rise to a new order. This is just a law of yeah. the universe, a law of creation, and it's, of course, it's that way. It would I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that it was the end of one cycle and a good, you know, the beginning of a new one, a positive one. Um, but one, one of the retreats I I took part in in, I think it was June. Um, there's a guy, a teacher called Shunyamurti. He sort of teaches. He dips into Vedanta and, you know, Buddhist Buddhism. Um, but he he's he's got this idea that we're about to go back to the singularity. He he's adamant and he said this is why everything is suddenly. And I know it was so strange to hear this coming from a Vedant, you know, a, you know, a, a, you know, essentially a guru teacher. And he was saying that everything is about. To, and he was he was tying in all the religious you know symbolism to demonstrate this. So like the alpha and the omega, even pointed out that you know the symbol and said look this is why this is the alpha and it's retracting and everything is coming back into the singularity so everything's going to reverse and he said and he was sort of saying unless you've got your wits about you and you've um broken down all those mental uh, barriers and illusions and fears they're all going to hit you as hard as everything else as then everyone everyone's going to experience all their fears and all their traumas and unless you're you know, and that that was it. That was really interesting for me. Is that he he was he's adamant. This that's it. it that's it. Now we are literally being drawn in, sucked back into the sing this back to the singularity point, um, and sooner rather than later. Um, that is uh, it's interesting that you should mention that because I I, I think I told you that um, I I have this friend here, a uh, French Polynesian guy that. Uh, He's a PhD psychologist and he studied physics at oh, yeah, yeah. Stanford. And the other day he invited me to come over and drink ayahuasca. And then he said, you know, um, and then we should inject ketamine at the end of the ceremony. <laughs> and I said, you've lost your fucking mind. And he said, no, 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 it's totally safe. And if you think about how, because he's also studied with, um, you know, Peruvian shaman and, you know, he's been here for a long time and, um, and, and he has medical training as well, so he had me there, too, that if something went wrong, he would know what to do, more or less. And uh, and I did my own research and confirmed that it was true, that there was no contraindications or contraindications or whatever the word is. And um, so uh, I agreed to do this. And one of the things that came up while um, I was in that state because he didn't go there with me. Oh, 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 I, I didn't explain how he hooked me in, which was that uh, the idea with adding admixture plants with ayahuasca, like Bobansana or uh, Chirixananga or any one of these other Uchusananga, um, is that the, uh, the our energetic uh, being is more open and receptive to input from other frequencies, or you could say plant spirits. And so... He said, you know, in, in the case of a man-made chemical, it's the same thing. 
And so, uh, you know, I'm definitely hip to the research on ketamine that puts it at the top uh, for treating certain types of neurological aberrations. I think PTSD and um, certain types of emotional trauma, uh, ketamine has proven to be more efficacious than anything else. And um, I have a long history of exposure to violence and even engagement in it when I was much younger. And so I knew that I had this kind of like unresolved trauma and that he kind of had cornered me because yeah. it seemed like he was probably right. And um, it still seemed crazy to, to mix anything like that with ayahuasca. But when I did it, at some point, he started talking about how there are these mathematical equations that uh, Dirac, the French mathematician, discovered. And that there is like a central, um, a central equation. And then there are all these other equations that uh, are, are sort of extrapolations of the central equation. And... He, uh, I, I really like the way he put this too. He said, you know, really the mathematics, uh, uh, just an illusory, uh, drapery. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, I, and it was crazy because as he's describing it, you know, I'm on two of the strongest psychedelics in the world and I can see the singularity that he's talking about with these, uh, uh, with Dirac's equations. So I'm pretty sure that I was able to see and possibly because they were in his head, even, I don't know. I mean, I've studied a lot of mathematics and physics as a lay person, but I'm pretty well convinced. I mean, the equations were beautiful and elegant, elegant and the way that they were situated around the singularity, which I think you made reference to in a sort of roundabout way. Um, there's the, the, the equations on this side and then they're mirrored in reverse and they sort of like circle the singularity. And every, the way he described it was every now and then a new thought. And I think what he meant is like what you could maybe describe as a thought of God comes along and collapses these into the singularity. And then from uh -huh. that, if you've ever seen on DMT, like the way things will fold into themselves and then emerge as like a variation of what was there before, okay. that was the, uh, what he was describing. And he was doing it from the point of view of physics and, um, you know, very sophisticated mathematics. But it sounds like nearly the same identical thing that this, I don't know if you said he was a Swami or. or yeah, he's a, he's a, a guru. He's a guru teacher in um, Sat Yoga Institute. He's based in Costa Rica, actually. Um, but yeah, he, he yeah, he's, he's been saying it for a while. He actually held the retreat. It was actually called preparation for the ca coming ca chaos. Um, you know, he's, it, it, it it looks quite a few things he said that you know i think he said if you think this year is pretty bad he said next year is going to be you know a picnic um you know you're going to think your last year was a picnic so and he, he sort of said um you know the coming famine is ha is going to it's going to come to it it's going to happen we're going to have food problems everywhere um and we're already starting to see that like you mentioned it china um so yeah, I'm not the only one saying that either. I just watched uh, Maynard James Keenan from Pool on Joe Rogan, and uh, Maynard is definitely someone that you could uh, suspect of having insider information for a number of reasons. And they were both; they seem resolutely convinced that this was like a warm-up drill. 2020 was just like the yeah the that's what they called it. They were both calling it a, just a warm-up. Okay, so the last thing I want to discuss a little bit is uh, uh, your music and um, your interest in studying the shamanic tradition. It sounds like from a Western musician's perspective, or um, um, and this is something that uh, you know I'm a musician as well, but I don't really have a lot of formal training. Um, there are. Uh, sounds that I have heard in, uh, for example, like the Shuar tradition, where I don't know uh, that we have language, uh, musical or otherwise, to describe these things. And I've always been curious to see what someone with, you know, some sort of, um, you know, more advanced technical training than I have, uh, how these sounds would be interpreted, microtonal bins that are you know, they're very, they're definitely consistent. You know what I mean? Like they're yeah. a certain distance relative to the pitch. Um, and another one is this language that seems to spontaneously arise 
Uh, I've seen it with Schwar Shaman, but I've also seen it uh, just come out of the mouths of several people that had never heard it from these Schwar Shamans. So it seems like a, a, a genuinely, um, objectively real, uh, channeled, non-human tongue. Um, so I guess... Uh, uh, how do you plan to approach this stuff? Like, what what is your um, what what is your objective in terms of study? Yeah, I mean, well, when you're dealing with something uh, that that fucking weird and non. Yeah. Well, I guess I go uh, if I go back to where it started. So obviously, towards the end of my masters, I made a seven a seven an eight part concept album. Um, which I think I've I've sent you I've sent you a link to before, but the idea I was trying to weave in this notion of you know trying I you know tying the archetypes there was a lot of sort of Jungian psychology in there, um, a lot of the work of Alistair Crowley in there, um, because you know the, some of the themes that I from some of the research I did for that was a lot of the you know the ideas in Gnosticism you know particularly the idea of you know the there's a really interesting quote where they talk about, and they've taken it from you know Egyptian mythology as well. That they're not they're talking about the you know the celestial realm. They're talking about them as 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 spiritual parts of the mind. So they're internal. So, but that's not to, that's not saying that they don't. So I've, I've, sometimes when I say that, people think, oh, you're just saying it's all in your head. Well, no, and yes, it is in your head. But it's that that. You know, it's that like fractalized and it's it's definitely like a spiritual journey inward and that stuff. So I tried to bring all that into the seven parts um, and just tying all sorts of like little bits of information in there that would, would tie this all those stories together. So the, Vitan, you know, this, this, this cycles in Vedanta and in Maya um, and, you know, archetypes of Jungian psychology um, and then like... So, the, you know, the separate parts would have, you know, the first part would be, you know, the, the Godhead, the all Brahman, you know, everything dividing itself up, forgetting who it is, and then dispersing into, you know, fractalized reality, you know, in individuals and stuff. And then there's this, basically the whole thing will go through an archetypal journey of, um, of realizing and, you know, oblivion and remembering the self. So I've, you know, at one point I go to, you know, rainbow dreams is the idea of the white light of consciousness being refracted into different colors and different frequencies. And we're, you know, we're all individualized bits stuck in those different frequencies. And then I go into, you know, later bar parts where I've got, you know, the darkest hour, which is where, you know, it's the moment before realization and, invoke the priestess is another part so you know you can have that's interpreted as isis or diana or mary um you know any of those uh feminine oh, yeah and even the tarot you know, you know it's the tarot card she is the lady that guards the you know the gateway to duality and she lifts the veil on the illusion of materiality and stuff um so i tried to weave all that in there you know, and to the point of the, you know, the phoenix who arises out of the black sun and, you know, whether some people say the black sun could be a singularity and stuff. Um, so I tried to put all of those, you know, symbols in there, you know, it was filmed in a prison to show that, you know, the God was in, you know, the Godhead is inside a prison of his own creation and own mind. So we, we managed to do all that. And basically the idea I wanted is that for people to watch that um, as a form of therapy, but also, I, want, I, I wasn't actively able to do it at the time, but I think I might now be able to do it a bit more easily, is was to have somebody take a, a dose of, of mushrooms, say, sort of between two and a half to three grams, and then have them watch that and, and then record, record their, what they take from it. But obviously, I never got to actually fulfill that, um, that side of it because, you know, it wasn't, you know, in, in terms of getting that done here in the UK, it's not easily done. Um, but now, you know, heading towards, you know, your question in terms of psychedelics is now becoming, especially psilocybin is being researched now for medicinal purposes. You know, I think his name is Dr. Carhart Harris. He's now 
doing that in the college imperial college london he's actively re researching that so my idea was being that i'm now going even more into you know the shamanic um you know i've been using san pedro and mushrooms for a while anyway and now recently ayahuasca i wanted to find out if seeing that you know the music i'd created for that piece was was my own creation you know it's kind of based in rock and stuff and it's not really something that's going to help somebody you know recover from that it's not really going to help heal somebody heal or or you know recover from trauma so I, what the idea was is that i wanted to find out what the you know the the musical elements of shamanic ritual music um were and whether they can be standardized and you know, brought into the practices that they're trying to do in the West now, because, you know, the, the West is kind of, we always want a magic pill. They're happy to, you know, to give you a drug to try and solve the problem, but they're not interested in the, you know, the holistic approach. And I think something that, you know, so many people have told me from, you know, shamanism and other cultures that the music and the dance and the rituals, they're very much a part of it, the psychedelics as well. It's, it's not just about taking a psychedelic and then you're magically healed. There's a lot of inner work that has to be done. And there's a lot of, you know, the dance and the sounds, they encourage that, like you were saying a minute ago. So the objective for me was to try and f find patterns in harmony and rhythm and stuff like that, that I can take from shamanic ritual music that can go hand in hand with, you know, the, the research that's been doing by the, you know, the, medic the medicinal side of it, um, you know, the scientists, so that when they do hopefully legalize these things here, which, you know, magic mushrooms, I'm pretty sure in the next five years is going to be used for antidepressants. I'm sure of it. But when it, when they do that, it's got the academic backing of the music as well. So that there's a holistic approach, not just a, here's a magic, you know, a pill with, you know, psilocybin in it and see what happens so that they understand that this is a bigger a bigger thing it's not it's a cultural nurt you know it's about nurture and it's about love and healing and stuff like that not just a here you go take that pill shut up and it's done you know so that's kind of what i wanted to achieve out achieve with it so that makes sense absolutely the irony is though that if there is a magic pill it is psilocybin and yeah. uh, what well, i was just i, I just saw a, a, a jordan peterson clip yesterday uh the, the psychologist of uh, I'm sure you know who he is. Um, uh, he was talking about researchers at John Hopkins, and uh, uh, one of them said, um, it is totally unprecedented in the history of psychiatry for a single dose of a medicine to have these kind of dramatic and lasting results. So already it's kind of like, I mean, that's the threat. Of, of, of these medicines that they are often efficacious with just a single dose. But I certainly agree with you that um, the results that they're getting in the clinical setting are certainly going to benefit from being um, reinforced with um, uh, the Icaros and, and, and the, um, I mean, for me, really, I, you know, I've heard some crazy things. I've seen some crazy things. I've seen uh, consistently, I've done it myself, you know, where uh, once you tap into these energies and whatever it is, whether it's a, 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 another layer of consciousness or if it's actually a spirit, um, as the song grows in intensity, if there's anybody in that TP or that Maloka that has got something um, that they need to let go of, uh, sometimes they'll start screaming like they're being murdered with a knife and then they'll, the, the shaman will run over and shake his leaves and blow the perfume and they'll just vomit and then they're fine like nothing happened at all. Um, and it does have something to do with uh, um, the song um, first provokes the uh, thing to manifest, to expose itself to the light. And that is what facilitates the banishing, which is incredibly similar to uh, the Western occult tradition and the hermetic magic practice of uh, summoning a demon that represents some sort of vice or and then constraining it to your service rather than being constrained to the service of the demon. Um, and then you banish with the lesser banishing uh, ritual of the pentagram afterwards. It's a, a slightly different um, 
expressions in the ritual, but it's fundamentally the uh, identically same idea. And so, um, the, then the thing is the role of someone like yourself, I mean, it certainly is important because, um, it, it, it's, it's going to be more meaningful from a clinical uh, perspective to have someone that has some formal education um, in order to, uh, you know, have like a westernized approach to evaluate these things, to, um, uh, to formalize the efficacy and present that in a way that is, you know, clinically relevant. So I applaud, yeah. your, I applaud your efforts <laughs> in that regard. I, I think um, I'm not even sure. I, I believe that even if, if it did happen and they said, yep, okay, we're going to use, you know, what if you, you know, the, we're going to combine the music and the dance and the rituals of, you know, the Hindus and shamans and the Siberian drumming. We're going to combine all that and we're going to put it with this treatment. I still don't know whether it would actually have the same effect. Um, just lacking. I, I'm, I personally still think I'd like to just if, go into the jungle and, you know, go with a shaman and have that treatment that way i think in a clinical setting as much as you know i'd like to contribute to it and help out do it i'd still you know let's just face it i'm just doing it so i can go and enjoy you know study it but i can really enjoy the reality of it. why why try and fix something that's already broke that's already why try and fix something that's not broken um well, because there are a lot of people that just can't go out into the jungle yeah and for those people, um, you know, having this, the, these kind of options is, is going to be, it's going to be important. So yeah, I, yeah. I think that's, that's definitely a valuable, um, and there are already, already inroads with this because there has, has been, um, or there have been studies that have, have very strongly suggested that music plays a significant role in all sorts of different healing and, and even learning and, um, you know, cognitive therapies and stuff. So uh, yeah. there's already a, a, a clinical basis for this kind of idea. And I think that um, the new psychedelic era is an opportunity for us to expand on that. Um, obviously, in, in, in terms of the, uh, the, the macro, the collective, um, we're having some pretty serious issues. Uh, but I think that the, uh, the, the root of changing these sort of uh, systemic aberrations is the, uh, the 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 individual work because the you know any um, any any cross section of, of any demographic is still just a reflection of its constituent parts, which are individual humans, and yeah. um, so in order to really address sociological and cultural problems, um, we need to do the work very quickly, and because we're running out of time suddenly we have this awareness that there are these compounds that can do decades of work in a couple of hours. And yeah. it's that kind of thing that gives me faith that there is some sort of plan or consciousness or even just the imposition of order somehow from energy that is um, sort of moving all of this in uh, 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 towards a, a, a coherent and, um, uh, you know, hopefully productive uh, resolution you know so yeah yeah a new what, world <laughs> yeah that that's what uh the, the the hermetic order of the golden dawn that's what they were anticipating and i, I think it's really interesting that in 1888 their slogan was inheritor of a dying world quit the <laughs> night and seek the day you know and I, I i have always taken the uh reference to the golden dawn to be a um like an anticipation of this uh new phase um it's a little troubling when you know like you look at alistair crowley who we've mentioned a few times he he talked about how that is happening but he also said he expected 800 years of dark ages first you know and that was only 100 years ago so yeah according to crowley like yes we are moving where we would like to see but it's going to be way longer than we would like Which yeah. internal consciousness doesn't really matter we'll just change our meat suits a few <laughs> thousand times and then i'll see you on the other side you know yeah <laughs> So, yeah. Well, right on, man. It's been really great to talk to you, and uh, we'll do it again soon. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cheers, man. Thanks for having me.